OK, so welcome everybody to lecture number six. And yeah, as you can see, the numbering here is a little bit out of sync with the number of lectures. So if you're worried about not finding lecture number six rather than unit number six on the course website, and yeah, this will go up shortly after that, um, that's to be expected because the numbers are out of sync. Um, because it makes very little sense to uh, tear apart slide decks. OK, um, so here's a reason why you don't want to watch this class only on YouTube, right? So let me show you this thing. This is a box of chocolates, right? OK, so now what does this have to do with this list here? Well, that's the leaderboard as of 9 AM this morning. And there are basically four teams who've made a non-trivial progress on the problem. So OK, here are chocolates in there, nice Belgian chocolates. And may I now ask to, uh, for the team with the name Louis, XD, C. Mallings, and Discrete Mathematics to come forward and pick up a piece, pick up a chocolate. So guys, come over. Is anybody of any of those, any of those teams here? OK, then. Guys, come over. So it's a fresh new box of chocolates, and have you pick. OK, so pick one. Oops. OK. OK. So let's give those two guys a round of applause. As added incentive, there will be another round of chocolates next Monday. Let's see who can get the chocolates back by then. And I'm happy to hand out up to five chocolates, except that this time it didn't make sense to divide the fifth chocolate among 10 teams. OK, so get your chocolates on Monday. Work hard. That one is probably OK. OK, sorry we are having a small memory card problem. We'll stitch it together afterwards. Not a big deal. OK, so for those who haven't come in yet, you get chocolates on Monday if you make it into the top five of the leaderboard. If you don't make it into the top five, at least you'll learn something about writing efficient algorithms. So we can't quite complete, compete with Netflix for an algorithm. What I wanted to do is I wanted to briefly just pick this up again in my notation, because we are going to actually extend it further and build on the perceptron to get to kernels and other stuff. And I just want to make sure you're familiar with my notation uh, and, yeah, my font size and all that. OK, so perceptron, we all know. Uh, so I wanted to give you a brief connection of you know, how this all relates to neural networks and to demystify a little bit the deep learning kind of things that are right now getting popular again. So this is from 1848, and that's, you know, the American Phrenological Journal, so there was a bona fide you know, scientific journal about you know, trying to figure out from your head shape how smart you were or whether you were an axe murderer. Um, so that's probably not how the brain works. Uh, the considerably better description then was, well, to have the idea that, you know, after all, you know, biological systems want to survive. So Good behavior should be rewarded in some way. Bad behavior should be, well, maybe not quite rewarded. In other words, if you're careless, the saber-toothed tiger eats you, and then that's not so good, right? But if you kill it, then, well, you survive, and the saber-toothed tiger doesn't. Um, the other thing is that um, correlated events should be combined. In other words, uh, even before looking at causal structure, you know, maybe you know, the fact that, you know, it's in the morning and then it gets warmer, as, as long as you learn that there's a correlation between those two things, that's probably already enough to get you through the day, even so you're not an astronomer and you don't understand why the sun rises and all those things. So in other words, you can have a completely crackpot theory about why the sun rises and you can still make it successfully through the day. Well, um, now you can do this in several ways. One is you can hard code it, and that's what a fly does. I mean, 
When a fly hatches, it starts flying around, buzzing around. It pretty much doesn't have to learn very much at all. As in, it might learn something for a few minutes until you know, it knows the length of its wings, but that's that. Uh, humans are a lot more intelligent, and they can learn a lot more. And that's why you're all here, because you want to learn about machine learning after all. right? So this is where you know, the information that comes out of my mouth and the slides and the chocolates gets transferred somehow into your brain. So here's how this happens. And Basically, so this is the only biology slide in the entire class, so don't worry. And it's not very deep. So basically, this is what a neuron looks like. So you have the cell body, which is like your CPU. It combines all the signals and does something smart with it, or maybe actually not so terribly smart, but there are a lot of them. Then you have a dendrite. Um, they basically you know, get all the information from all the other neurons around it. And then you know, they basically lead it to the cell body where stuff gets combined. Then you have those synapses, which is basically actually where a lot of the action happens. Namely, this is where the signal gets transferred from one to the other neuron. And depending on how you set the weights, well, basically, the, those neurons will listen more to one or, or not. And then you have this axon, which is basically just like a long cable, which can lead the information somewhere else. The cable might be short. The cable might be long, depending on you know, what they do. So for instance, if you know, these are motor neurons. The cable goes through your entire spine and then into the arms, and that's how I can move my arms and my legs, right? And that's why if you break your spine, you're quadriplegic, because basically all those accents are gone. Or at least the connection is gone. Um, so they can be like a meter long, so like three foot, um, and do interesting things. So now, this is all of biology that you need to know for this class. Um, Here's yet a third or fourth way by now on how to get the linear classifier. Remember, we had naive Bayes, and we looked at the difference in the log scores. Then we had the perceptron. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to model a neuron, and uh, that actually will do the same thing. Namely, what I'm saying is, well, those neurons have some synaptic weights, wi, at their synapses. So basically, that's where. You know, dendrites come in. So these guys, right? These are the dendrites. And then the other neurons might provide it with some signals x1 through xn. And so what this neuron then does is it goes and combines all those signals in some weighted combination. And in the dumbest case, it just outputs that. And in a smarter case, it might just decide not to do very much and then you know, if it's above a threshold, it'll do something, otherwise it won't do anything. Right. So quite often you have that kind of a hysteresis effect um, where maybe up to some level it doesn't do much, and then, okay, it starts firing, firing, firing. And this gives you a very nice nonlinearity. Okay. There's some discussion about exactly what the shape looks like. There's also quite some discussion as to whether that's really capturing things or whether or not the firing and the timing of the firing and the firing rate has something to do with it. Because it's super expensive for a neuron to send a signal, right? So that's why basically just applying a very high voltage and you would get this leak current and we'd basically fry our brains because it would use so much energy. So in other words, applying that kind of a voltage, even if it's just a few millivolts, is not fun. It's very expensive. So instead, what the brain does is, well, if it says, well, you know, this is the signal, it'll just send out a couple of spikes. And now if I wanted to encode a signal that is maybe you know, at the lower intensity, let's say something like this, you would send out you know, fewer spikes, maybe like so, right? And so this way, it costs you less energy to encode it, whereas otherwise you, know, you would have you know, essentially DC current frying your brain. So now there's an interesting other thing, and I've sort of kind of hinted at it here, right? Those two neurons actually are synchronized with that spike. And there is some argument that by actually synchronizing those neurons, you can encode a lot more information. And that area, I think, is a lot more dynamic than the firing rates themselves. And 
yeah, basically take a biology class to teach you this stuff properly. I'd probably just embarrass myself if I went into this much more. But it's a cool thing to look at. OK, so what we already saw is that if I have this nonlinearity, right, and if I have w dot x plus b, well, I can immediately figure out, let's say, you know, this is here, here it's spam, and here's ham, that, well, and if, let's say this is my threshold b, that w dot x plus b, uh, w dot x equal, well, plus b, well, actually in this case, minus b equals 0, that this specifies a hyperplane. Okay. Does somebody have an idea what this w vector does in specifying this hyperplane? It's a normal vector. Yep, correct. So if this is my coordinate system, and if this is w, this specifies you know, the hyperplane. And I'm probably going to do a horrible job at drawing it right now, but there's a right angle here. And then the intercept is given by not quite b, but actually by, well, we can divide everything by w, right? So b over w. Yeah. Because basically, you know, the larger w is, the easier it is to achieve b. Now, that means we have a little bit of a degree of freedom here, namely, you know, how do we choose the pair w and b? Because if I multiply both of them by 20, I get the same hyperplane, right? And we'll actually exploit that later on when we look at linear classifiers. Yep? OK. So if you have two types of data and you want to separate them, well, that's exactly this thing here, right? Yeah. Now, if what you might be asking for is, well, let's say we have two kinds of data. And we have these guys here. Well, if you have text and numbers, then distinguishing text and numbers is very easy. However, if you have pairs of text and numbers, right, then you need to first go and map them into some joint vector space where you can do this operation. Stay tuned for how to do this. We'll get to that towards the end of this class, and we'll do a lot more over the next week. So is that what you're looking for? Oh, okay. So, okay. So, first of all, I guess we all agree that all of these guys here are separating hyperplanes. But if I now had another circle here, right, then there is no way I can really separate this accurately anymore, right? So, now the only way that I can do something with it is either by modifying my perceptron algorithm, because I mean this clearly has no non-zero margin of separation. I could, for instance, say, well, you know, let's ignore this thing and let's separate the rest. And there are loss functions for that. And we'll be doing a lot of this over the next week, so this is fine. Or you can actually modify the perceptron algorithm. And you modify it by basically giving each observation one extra dimension. So this is the margin perceptron. Um, there's just not enough time to go through this right now, but maybe we can either cover it in the recitation or you might have fun with it in the homework. But basically the idea is that rather than just encoding x, I encode x and then a unit vector. So this is a vector sub x, which has, let's say this is, for instance, the 20th observation. Then you would have all zeros here up to position 19. Then you have a 1, and then you have all zeros again. right? Um, so this way, you can trivially see that the problem is always separable, right? Because now, you know, by adding one dimension per observation, this separates. Now, 
you could run the perceptron on that kind of data. And this sounds crazy at first, because you know, after all, at test time, we don't have that information. However, you can prove that this will give you a good separation also in the remaining dimensions. So this lets you, in a very simple hack, ignore extra dimensions, and you get basically the margin perceptron. Um, so I said, details of that you might either enjoy in the homework or in the recitation or in some other context. OK. Uh, thanks for the questions. That was good. Any other questions? Uh, that's not a dot product yet. But what you would do is you would take a dot product between this and some now larger vector, which you know is large enough that it covers, you know, if this is in RD, and I have M observations, so this is basically in RM, then W would be in RD plus M. Right. And that's the place you can do it. OK, so this is something you already saw, you know, distinguishing green ham from red spam. And this is the perceptron algorithm. You already saw this. And you also saw that it's kind of a nice algorithm because the harder the problem, uh, the longer it'll take me to solve it. And if the problem is really easy, I can get the solution very quickly. And we saw the proof. So this is my favorite example of why you don't want to use the perceptron straight out of the box if you have noisy data. You can lose millions of dollars. That's what happened to them. Great game. And that little detail destroyed the, the problem. Um, now, who has heard of stochastic gradient descent yet? Okay, That's a fair amount of people, probably about half the audience. So let me just give you a quick advanced preview. If you haven't seen stochastic gradient descent, don't get scared. I'll explain it to you. So it's, it's not scary. It doesn't bite. So here's what you do. You say, OK, so basically, let's say we want to minimize some loss function. Some loss, which depends maybe on the data, depends on some labels, and it depends on, let's say, some parameter w. For instance, it's something like sum over i going from 1 to m yi minus w dot xi squared. And for good measure, let's put the 1 half here. And this should look very familiar, right? This is linear regression. And for good measure, let me put the 1 over m here, because that doesn't really change things. right? If I minimize it, or I minimize it with 1 over m, it doesn't really change. And let me call these guys here little l of xi, yi, and w. This is basically the loss that I'm going to incur by seeing x, predicting w dot x, let's go here, and observing y. So this is a convex function. I guess we've all seen convex functions before. At least we saw them in class. So this shouldn't be too scary. Okay. Now, if a lot of the data looks very similar, then going through all the data and then taking an update step is actually a glorious waste of time, right? Because you've already seen the thing over and over. This is just like, suppose we gave you homework and we gave you like 100 problems. And they all look very similar. You'd get really frustrated. And you wouldn't really learn much uh, after problem number three or four. And you'd get, you'd get mad and have a revolt on, on Google Groups, right? You would do that. Now, you could also simply say, well, OK, screw it. I'm not going to do all the homework. But I still want to learn what's you know, in the problems that uh, Geoff and Alex handed out. So let's just pick you know, a random problem, solve that, pick another random problem. And at some point, I'll find out, actually, I'm doing pretty well, and then I'll stop. That, doesn't, that wouldn't give you full marks on you know, the insane homework of 100 assignments. But you'd still learn pretty, a pretty good thing from it. So that's effectively what a stochastic gradient descent algorithm will also do. It will do the following thing. It will compute the gradient for one of those losses here. So let's start. We start with w equals w0. For instance, w equals 0 is a good start. 
and then I perform an update. W goes into W minus, and we do a little bit of hill climbing here, some eta, which is a learning rate, and at the moment I'm just keeping it fixed, is your step size, times, you walk a little bit in the gradient direction of one of those losses, dw of L of xi, yi, and w. So the, in the regression case, this becomes simply w goes into w minus eta times, well now let's take the derivative of that, that's just y minus w dot xi times xi, so we have this guy here, minus w dot xi times xi, and I keep on doing this. Right. So this is actually very intuitive. Basically, for each observation, you measure how well or how poorly you're doing, and you're going to update your parameters very much if you know, you do very poorly, and you're updating in that direction into which these xi's point. Okay. Now, we can do the same thing with a perceptron. So, we'll give some theory to go with this later on, but I just want to give you an intuition of what's actually happening. Because the perceptron is a really, really useful instance and the starting point for a lot of threads that afterwards developed in machine learning. It's a starting point for linear methods. It's a starting point for stochastic gradient descent. It's a starting point for neural networks. So, and people have generalized this idea of the perceptron in many directions, which is why it really helps if you understand the basic idea in the beginning. Guys, by the way, if you, have, if you need space, there are one, two, three seats in the front. Just, you know, I won't bite, and you get a better view. So, uh, yep? Yes. Correct. So you can do two things. You could basically assume if I give you an insane amount of homework that the homework supply is infinite. And you just, you know, pick one homework from the stack and the next one and so on and you keep on doing this. And if necessary, you randomly shuffle it. The other thing is you could actually randomly permute, you know, the problems and go through them over and over again. So there's actually you touch upon a very good point. So there's actually some subtle detail and difference between whether the sequence is truly random or whether you just randomly permute the observations. And there's, the analysis is slightly different. For all practical purposes for a 10701 class, make sure your data is in random order and then just go through it. And you don't have to worry much about the details. But yes, there are considerable details in the proofs in terms of what you can guarantee. Um, so, how do we make our way back to the perceptron? Well, we pick another loss function, namely L of x, y, and w, x, i, y, i, w, is the max of zero, and then minus y, i, w dot x i. Okay. So this loss function, if you were to draw it, would look like so. Um, okay, let's draw it here. It's increasing here and it's zero there. And what I'm plotting here is y i f of x i, so that's y i w dot x i. So what you can, I guess, very easily see is if y, if, if this quantity here is positive, am I making a mistake or not? Okay, who votes for mistake if, if this quantity here is positive? Okay. Who votes for getting it right if this quantity is positive? Right, overwhelming majority, right? And you're right. Because that basically means, for instance, let's say this is a positive observation, so I have w dot x i greater than zero, and this y is also greater, is, also, is one. If it's negative, then this is negative, and that has to be negative, so that's also fine. 
And so therefore, this loss function, since I'm taking the negative of that, is only greater than 0 if I make a mistake. Now let's take the gradient of that. And so what I get is dw of l, of this, I'm just being lazy of not writing it up, is going to be 0 if correct. And it's going to be minus yi xi if error. Okay. And so we can use that directly, right? We can see that we will update our weight vector with yi times xi if we make a mistake. And we don't update it at all if we don't make a mistake. This is the perceptron algorithm after all, right? This was this algorithm. And yes, you can add a b to it, and that's fine, and it works exactly the same way. So what we've just seen is that we can view the perceptron algorithm as stochastic gradient descent over a admittedly rather weird loss function. And this is absolutely not the best loss function to use. Right? Why is it not a good loss function? Can somebody see something that could have possibly gone wrong with this algorithm? So what's the difference between this thing here, this definition, and the algorithm up there? There's one line different between this and that. So as in, one character has one extra line over here on the left. Hint, what happens if I run this algorithm and I initialize the weight vector and b to be 0? What happens? Exactly. So if you're unlucky, depending on what you define the derivative at this very point to be, b and w may actually not do anything whatsoever. So the entire algorithm stalls. And that's an amazingly brittle thing to do with your learning algorithm, right? Such that the performance of the algorithm depends fundamentally on how you define the derivative at the non-smooth point. Okay. And without giving too much away, as in we'll do that next week anyway, the trick is to just shift this thing over here. So in other words, not only do you want to make sure that your loss function is that you get things right, but that you get things right confidently. You probably remember long, long time ago when you practiced multiplication tables, you know, when you were in elementary school. It wasn't just a matter of, you know, getting the answer after five minutes of thinking, but getting it right each time just like so, right? This was trying to get it, learning this thing such that you can come up with an answer confidently, as opposed to just sort of kind of guessing it hanging on by the skin of your teeth. Same large margin principle applies here. And you get an entire family of algorithms, and a lot of people have gotten tenure from it. So OK, good. So we went through the convergence proof, and we saw that, yeah, size of the margin matters. You've seen the perceptron. I think Job's demo is probably a lot prettier. Here's one thing, and this kind of leads us back to what we call what came up as a question before, namely, what happens if I have a point over here, right? So I have all those red triangles, and I have this black guy over there. So actually, several things can happen. So if you think about it, you know, I could have, OK, so this is the situation where everything is nicely linear separable, and I want to separate the blues from the reds. Now, if instead of hyperplanes, I gave you circles to separate the blues from the reds, you couldn't really do that very easily, right? I mean, yes, maybe if you pick a really, really large circle with a monstrous radius such that this is almost flat, you think can, sorry, can sort of kind of squeeze it in. But if I tell you, you know, the radius has to be less than one foot long, then you couldn't, right? So here, even though the data is very nicely separable, it's not nicely separable in, by using the tools to separate it that I give you. Okay. This famous example is something called the truck backer upper. 
So basically, you've probably admired at some point one of those truck drivers when they you know, have a trailer attached to it, and they drive backwards. And they manage to maneuver this trailer into a parking spot in a rather amazing way. They're really good at that. And so when people started working in neural networks, they figured, hey, this must be a really hard problem. Can we train a neural network to do so? Because then we can get rid of the driver. Right? Self-driving car, anno 1960 or 1970. And I found this really hard, and it's really hard, and uh, well, people worked on it quite a bit. Until somebody realized, actually, let's transform it into polar coordinates. And once you do that, the problem becomes linearly separable. It turns out to be really easy in polar coordinates. In other words, just by changing the representation, all of a sudden the problem turned from something where you're using you know, forks to eat soup to something that's actually very nicely separable. So sometimes when your problem is hard, it may be just that you're trying with the wrong tools. However, it could also be that the problem simply truly is hard. And a lot of what machine learning does is it tries to come up with tools to distinguish this from that situation. Now, what, for instance, people do is what's called non-parametrics. So, Non-parametric tools are tools where you say, well, I'm going to use maybe a simple guess initially to solve the problem, but as I get more data, I'm going to increase the set of tools that I'm going to bring to bear. So at some point, in addition to circles, I'm going to maybe add squares and then you know, hyperplanes and other objects to separate things, such that in the limit of getting an infinite amount of data, I will get things right. This need not be the fastest algorithm to solve a specific problem in practice, but at least in terms of you know, rates of conversions and everything. But at least I know that as I get more data, eventually I will get everything right. We actually already saw one, of, one or two of those algorithms before. Does somebody remember what these algorithms were? Hey, we only had six. This is the sixth lecture. Think back about the previous five lectures. Do you remember any of the tools that we did there that might have been non-parametric? Perfect. Kernel density estimator does that. Nearest neighbors also do that. They're closely related as you increase the scale. So uh, this is basically why you want to design algorithms which, as you get more data, get better. Now, let's get to the issue of uh, minimum error separation. So this sort of kind of killed neural networks in the 70s. And this is a book by Minsky and Papert. And it basically shows that if I have a problem that's not linearly separable, and I want to find the linear separator that separates with the smallest number of errors, then this is actually NP-hard. Okay. So here's an example where I can't linearly separate it. This is the so-called XOR problem, right? And I mean, no matter how you draw the line, you're ne never going to get all the reds on one side and all the greens on the other side. Of course, if you remember this trick here, right? By adding you know, an extra dimension for each observation, I basically end up lifting the greens out and the reds down. And then I can nicely slice between them. And that's effectively how you can sort of sidestep that problem. Um, and we're going to go and look at ways how to deal with those errors. Suffice it to say, a lot of the hardness comes from the fact of how you deal with boundary cases. Because you can have a lot of points exactly on the boundary, and they can actually add this complexity. So that turns out that in practice, by just changing the question slightly, you can turn a problem from NP-hard into polynomial. It's not the first time that this has happened where so I remember maybe five years ago at NIPS, or I, I forgot whether it was NIPS or somewhere else. I think it was somewhere else. And they were dueling talks back to back. The first, a talk about, hey, this problem is impossible to solve. And then the following, hey, under this, as in it's NP-hard, and, and the next one, this problem has a polynomial time algorithm. And so then once you dig a little bit down further into the details, you realize that they changed the problem definition ever so slightly. And by changing it sufficiently slightly, in still a perfectly reasonable way, you could actually solve it. 
So one of the more famous examples is, for instance, Scheibe and David. I th uh, I, no, I forgot whether it was Scheibe and David, but it's basically a, a NIPS paper on that it's impossible to find you know, some consistent properties in clustering. And then the following year, a paper which showed that it was possible. And that just changed the problem slightly. So be careful when you pin down your problem not to make it impossible to solve just by asking for a bit more than what you really should be asking for. And those requests sometimes can be very innocuous, so be very careful. OK, now nonlinearity and preprocessing. And this is where we're going to go and introduce kernels in a slightly roundabout way. So, you know, in regression, when we got those nonlinear functions by just preprocessing the data, we had, you know, the polynomials by just taking x and x squared, x cubed, and so on. And that was fine. Now, what we could do with the perceptron is we could map the data into feature space, right? We map x into phi of x. So let's go back to the example where we have mixed data, right? This is the question that came up before. Let's say I have something like an email, you know, the quick brown and so on. I guess you know how it continues. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And then maybe I know, let's say, the most significant byte. Uh, well, no, that's probably not a bad idea. And I know the total length of the email. Okay. And let's say it's four kilobytes. And that's maybe because I have a lot of header information. And this is my email. And I want to, so this is x. Now, what I want to do is I want to turn this into data that I can run my classifier on. Let's say a linear classifier. So one thing that I could do is I could, for instance, map this into the vector which has 4 at the last end. So, I'm, so why would I not pick 4,000 and 4 instead? Because, yeah, otherwise the scale is kind of wrong, right? Uh, so otherwise this term would completely dominate things, and it would take a very long time to converge. Remember the example where I took the classification problem and I stretched one dimension and all of a sudden all the margins got really narrow everywhere else. You don't want to do that. And then you would basically have, you know, maybe the maps into hash ID, well, token ID number three, maybe that's five, maybe that's a two. Then I would have the vector which is zero, one, it's this guy here. One, it's this guy here. 0, 5, oh, sorry, one. 1, yes, thank you. <laughs> and then I'd have, you know, an arbitrary number of zeros, or maybe whatever the dog and the lazy fox and whatever do, and then I have the 4. Now this is phi of x. So what you've just done is you've computed a feature vector based on the original email. And that felt entirely natural to do, right? Because, you know, you would do that anyway. Um, <clears throat> and now we can go and solve the problem in this space. And the hope is that, you know, by finding out whether the email is short or long, I can classify better whether, you know, it's spam or ham. And, well, if I need to implement that then in my code, because I might not necessarily want to store those vectors, they may be computationally inefficient, maybe it's better to just leave the emails as they are, I effectively have to code up an inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime, where this is now you know, the features of that email and the features of this email. And remember, before that, we had w is a sum over you know, i in the errors yi xi, this now becomes w equals, can somebody tell me what it looks like? Well, it's still a sum over all the i's and the errors, right? How does it continue? 
if I now operate in phi of x rather than in x? Correct. Yi phi of xi. So the only thing that really changed is that I put a phi off around the xi's. That's the only thing that changed. Now, <clears throat> if you'd seen that about 15 years ago, you could have written a lot of papers. We had a pretty good time. Um, so let me give you an example. So here's a problem that's clearly not linearly separable. So it's the pesky you know, circles in an ellipsoid and then crosses around it. And if you were to map this into you know, a, in this case, you know, space of second degree polynomials, you could immediately see that you can separate it. Why is this really easy to see? Because, well, all the ellipsoids and hyperbolas and parabolas can be viewed as just solutions of a quadratic equation. So therefore, there you have it. So, OK. So that's how you can do things if you know explicitly what you're looking for. Now, here's another example. Um, <clears throat> let's build a very, very naive OCR system. So I want to do you know, handwritten character recognition. And maybe I don't quite have this cool perceptron with the 400 light sensors and the printed cards. And I want to do something a little bit smarter. So maybe I can say, well, let's use the prior knowledge and I count how many loops I have and three joints and four joints and angles and you know, how much ink is on the page uh, for each of those characters. And these are good features. And if I can get them right, then I can actually you know, classify. Okay. Can somebody see something wrong with this approach? Okay. Let me give you an example. This is how Americans write the one. This is how Germans write the one. This is how Americans write the seven, or something like that. This is how Germans write the seven. Some people write the two like so. OK, my handwriting is awful, I know. Some people write it like so, and so on and so on. So uh, this is probably a little bit less of a problem in Asian languages, where people really care about a very standardized way of writing your characters. But most of Europe and North America, people write in really horrible ways, as you've probably noticed from my handwriting. Yes? Just like, you know, how many black pixels they are, right? So for an eight, maybe I have, you know, a fair amount of, you know, black stuff. And for a one, I don't have so much. So I'm just making up some features, pulling them out of my head. So can see, somebody see something wrong with that approach? What could possibly go wrong if I did this? The six and the nine would, yeah. And then I could maybe add another feature which you know, determines whether the squiggle uh, is at the bottom or the top. So that will fix it. But something a lot more fundamental. Correct. Different. So there's a lot of natural variation in how people write things. So then I need to hire an expert in you know, handwriting, and I can model this. Um, so maybe, you know, that'll cost me some money, but I can fix it. What else could go wrong? But you can see it's already getting expensive, right? So what else could go wrong? Well, I might have a pen that runs out of ink, right? And so rather than a zero, I get this, right? Or, well, the mailman drops the envelope, right? Get, falls into the dirt. There's some dirt on the camera, on the scanner. Stuff like that can happen. In other words, the data in reality is going to be a lot more messy than this very clean stuff here. So if you have very clean data, go for the rules, get them. They will help you a lot in adding a lot of prior knowledge. 
A lot of real data doesn't have this. So here's an example of slightly more real data. So basically, open up your favorite mail client and look at all the headers of an email. And you see that there's a lot of stuff in there that you never see. All this metadata is like super useful to find out whether an email is spam. Right? So that's what you can use. So, and this is actually where a lot of the engineering is being spent in industry, right? So, you know, you've, you know, any male spam filtering team has their own trade secrets on which features they use and how in which order and so on. So let me give you an example of something that, why this is actually qu quite a challenge. Um, so at some point, this was back in the time when I worked at Yahoo, uh, they realized, well, okay, actually all the spam emails have some interesting content in terms of payload, right? So often they would have a URL. So obviously, it's a really good idea to check what's in the URL and look at the page. And then if the page looks really spammy, there's a good chance that the email's also spammy. Okay. This was an awesome feature. And spam classification improved a lot. So does somebody have an idea how the spammers worked around it? Yep. you should start working as a spammer. This is exactly what they did. Awesome. Great. So basically what happened is they sent these spam emails around midnight or 1 or 2 AM. At that point, it went into the spam fil uh, well, it, it basically, you know, the, the, the spam filters. And they checked the payload, what's in there, and which page it points to. And, they cr and the Yahoo servers crawled that page, and it looked perfectly OK. So they let it through, because you don't want to have the email pending for a long time. And then at 8 or 9 AM, when the user logged in, uh, that previously perfectly OK link went to send you to some suggestions of, well, body part enlargements or whatever. So that's what happened. And there are ways around that. And you can see it's an arms race. But that's where you can spend a lot of time in trying to do a good job. So not only do you need to solve the machine learning, you actually need to solve the problem. OK, you can do more feature engineering, and I'm not going to go into this. Um, but here's basically what happens, right? So the only thing that changes in the entire code is that wherever we had x, we now have phi of x. This is the only transformation that we really made, right? Everything else stays the same. Same thing here. What's this step here? So this is the perception on features. Now, here's a problem. Well, for those features, you need a domain expert. In some cases, you can't avoid it, like in spam filtering. But in some cases, you would rather also have some slightly automatic way such that you can make some progress, even if you can't afford maybe an expert in Chinese OCR. Um, so, well. What do you do if you have no idea what to do? Well, you try everything, right? And you see what sticks. OK, that's exactly what we're going to do. And you just want to do this sufficiently efficiently that you can actually get all those attributes very quickly. So uh, this leads us to kernels. And she is one of the key researchers in that area, Grace Waba. Um, basically. Yeah, she's been working on that for at least 40 years. Um, I mean, it dates back further. It dates back to Aron sign, and he wrote this uh, on the theory of reproducing kernel, kernels. Uh, this was actually written, I think, in the 40s, and then published in the Berkeley. There's some, some Berkeley proceeding series from the 50s, and the original paper is actually in French. But essentially, I mean, she really made this popular in large scale. So let's work our way towards kernels. By the way, are there any problems with what we had so far? Cool. Everybody's quiet. Everybody's happy. 
if I'm moving too fast, you need to slow me down by asking questions. If I'm moving too slow, start yawning, please. OK, so solving XOR, remember this problem that we had before? Well, what I can do is I can solve, map it, for instance, in x1, x2, and x1, x2. If I do this, well, now in those three dimensions, it's linearly separable, so everything's good. What I could also do is I could have some quadratic features. Right? So there, for instance, I can map x, which is a two-dimensional object, into x1 squared, square root 2x1, x2, and x2 squared. Now that looks awfully contrived. Why on earth would I do this? Well, here's the reason. So let me take that dot product. And by picking this square root exactly the right way, this thing turns into x dot x prime squared. Now this looks a lot simpler than this or that. So what we're just seeing here is the first tip of the iceberg of the general idea that sometimes explicitly mapping into this feature space may be super expensive, but computing inner products between two points in feature space may be very cheap. And this has led to thousands of papers by now, that very idea. So essentially, rather than directly manipulating the objects in this high dimensional space, you indirectly manipulate and compare them. Any questions? So this is a really fundamental thing. And by the way, you know, these are the features. And we'll see how this holds in for more than just, you know, those terms, but you can check for yourself that x dot x prime raised to the power of d, where d is an integer, also satisfies this. Quite perplexingly, for anything else than an integer, it doesn't hold. That is a considerably more messy proof where you need to expand things into spherical harmonics. Yep? OK. So these plots are, well, x1 squared. So it doesn't depend on x2. And x1 squared is 0 here, and it's large there, and it's large there. This is x1, x2. And you know it's large here and there. And no, sorry, it's small here and there, very negative. And here it's very positive. And this one is just x2 squared, again, plotted in two dimensions. So now if I want to classify this two-dimensional space, I can take a linear combination of these three functions. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? So let me show you a, picture, uh, a movie if it works. Uh, and yep, there we go. Somebody, somebody a guy called Udi Aharoni, had probably way more time on his hand than one would hope for. And he made this really awesome demo. And so you go and you know, raise the points into you know, this three-dimensional space. So this was exactly the example that we had before. And now, wow, in comes the hyperplane. And it slices the red guys from the blue guys. And it just looks gorgeous. It's a really cool visualization. OK, so. And there is the separating hyperplane, which now was a hyperplane before, but now it's an ellipsoid. So this is the cool thing that you know you have a hyperplane before, and you project it back to your original space, and there it'll take on all sorts of weird shapes that would be really, really hard to parameterize directly, but by virtue of this feature map, you can do it efficiently. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. What we basically get is that you know extracting features can be like super expensive. So for instance, second order features, well, you know, two out of a thousand is expensive. Um, for higher order polynomials, it gets even worse, so you don't really want to do that. And so instead of really computing those features, you just try to compute the inner products implicitly. And for some features, this works. It doesn't work for all of them. And you can still write papers about how to do this really effectively. So if you want to get a lot of functional analysis, so we just had a paper at ICML on how to do some of those computations in log linear time. So you can still work on these problems right now if you want. Um, now let me define formally what I mean by a kernel, because you'll be hearing that over and over and over. 
A kernel is a function that takes two arguments and is symmetric in them. So k of x and x prime is a symmetric function. And that has the property that it corresponds to an inner product in some space. Now that sounds weird, right? Corresponds to an inner product in some space. That sounds like as if I didn't even know what the space was. As a matter of fact, there are a couple of kernels where people came up with a kernel first. They proved it's a kernel. And then only much later, they went and showed some feature map here. Does somebody have an idea why this feature map need not be unique? What could I do to this to not change the kernel, but change phi rather drastically? Exactly. I could rotate it. Rotations will do. As a matter of fact, I can do even crazier things than rotation. So if I have, you know, phi of x, phi of x prime, then I can insert any matrix V, V transposed. And as long as this matrix here is the identity, the product with itself is the identity, things are okay. So unitary matrices definitely would do that trick. Great answer. But you can even, you know, change the dimensionality and, you know, blow things up in scale and so on. So you can do crazy things. And in some cases, those crazy things will give you computationally very efficient algorithms. So there's, for instance, one algorithm called random kitchen sinks, and then our extension that we called fast food, don't ask why, um, that plays exactly with those tricks a lot. So, but that's why this representation need not be unique. However, there's a very nice theorem that we'll get to eventually, which is that we can actually perform tests for whether something is a kernel uh, by simply solving an integral equation. And don't worry, we'll, we'll get to that. Any questions about that so far? So there's a green slide, you should kind of get the idea. So, well, we actually have it here, right? So this is our phi of x. So what then happens is that w dot x is sum over i in all the errors, y i phi of x i dot phi of x. As a matter of fact, that's this slide here. Right? So now what I can do is, this is obviously my kernel, this term here, and I can just compute it directly as a kernel. So in other words, what's happening here is the only change that we have to do in our algorithm is rather than you know, taking inner products with you know, the xi's directly, we now have to you know, store all the xi's on which we made mistakes and compute a linear combination of kernel functions of those terms. Okay. What could possibly go wrong if we had a lot of data? And I make a lot of mistakes. What could possibly go wrong? I could get numerical overflow. Okay, for that I can be clever about how I aggregate. So that can be probably mitigated. But you're on the right track. Yep. Overfitting? Overfitting, not necessarily, because I can probably, you know, add some regularization and that is controlled and we'll get to that. But yeah, that's also a good suggestion. Yep. Exactly. So the thing is, if I have a million observations in here over which I need to compute the sum, then classifying a, sim a simple email means I have to compare the simple email to a million other emails. And that's just crazy expensive. So in other words, I've pretty much killed all the scalability that I had. And there are ways around it. And those ways essentially try to represent this, you know, maybe a one million dimensional expansion then in terms of a much smaller subset of emails. So this is what's called reduced set methods, 
And we won't be going into those into a lot of detail, but maybe there'll be an assignment. Yeah, the reduce got a little bit reduced, sorry. So in other words, you might run out of memory, and you'll run out of time computing it. Neither of the two is very good. So let's look at you know, polynomial kernels. <clears throat> so the extension is basically, for instance, you know, we can take x dot x prime plus a constant c raised to the power of d. And then we want to prove that such a kernel corresponds to a dot product. So one way to prove it, and that's the direct brute force approach, is to actually simply show what the feature map is. And so, well, OK, we go and expand this. And everybody knows how to expand this. So it's d over i, so i, I choose d, uh, x dot x prime to the i, c to the d minus i. So c is a, some non-negative constant. And this basically already will give us weighting of different degrees of the polynomial. Right? So linear combinations of these terms correspond to polynomials of degree up to d. Furthermore, if I pick a very large c, then the leading terms basically for small i will you know, have a large contribution. Whereas if I pick a very small c, then the high degree terms, you know, close to d, will have a very large contribution. So this already means that by tweaking c and playing with d, I can choose you know, the degree of the polynomial functions that you're going to fit. And secondly, also, whether I care more about high degree terms or low degree terms. So these are already some hints at devices of capacity control. We'll later on see how this can be much more formalized. But what you then do is once you have this expression here, you can, for instance, expand this directly also into a sum. But I assume that we already showed that this is a kernel. So what we just did is we also implicitly used the fact that if two functions are kernels, then their sum is a kernel. Let's prove that just in case. So let's say I have some kernel k of x and x prime. And that's phi of x dot phi of x prime. And I have some function L of x and x prime. And that's maybe psi of x dot psi of x prime. Right? So k plus L of x and x prime, I can write it as, OK, any suggestions from you guys? How would you write this? If I have this feature space for phi, for k, and the size for l, what would be a good candidate for the joint feature space? Exactly, the direct sum between phi and psi. Phi of x, psi of x, dot phi of x prime, psi of x prime. Okay. And I can maybe call this thing here chi of x. Okay. So what basically happens is I take the first vector, and I take the second vector, and I concatenate them. That's, voila, my new vector. Yep? Well, let's say the first vector is, let's say phi of x is 1 and 3. And let's say psi of x is 19 and 6 and 4. Right? So this is phi, this is psi. Then I can go and combine it into a vector chi, which is 1, 3, 19, 6, 4. This thing here is chi. So you just paste. Now, turns out you can even do that with infinite dimensional vectors. 
one way to you know formally do that is you just pick you know one coordinate from each and you keep on going. And since it's infinite dimensional, it's fine. Overall, this is you know the direct sum of two Hilbert spaces. So there's less hand wavy math that goes with it, but for the purpose of this class, it's enough if you understand the intuition. Uh, you should take a function analysis class if you're interested in these things. It's beautiful mathematics, but we don't have time for it here. Um, so a couple of things that you care about with a kernel. One thing is, first of all, that you actually com can compute this cheaply. Because if you can't, then, well, there's not so much point in using a kernel, right? The other thing is that you know, those kernel functions themselves should be useful. As in, you know, they should correspond to maybe smooth functions or do something else that's reasonable. Um, and this is where a lot of prior knowledge and statistical modeling comes in. And without giving too much away, they also correspond to covariance functions. So basically, k of x and x prime tells you how correlated, how similar two points are x and x prime. So a good guess for a kernel is something where you would say, well, you know, two points, if I think they are similar in a reasonable way, I want the kernel value to be large, and if they are very dissimilar, I want it to be small. Now, I can't just use any such function and hope that it will do the trick, and I'll show you a counterexample in a moment. Uh, but the obvious thing is, yes, this function has to be symmetric. That's like the first sanity check that you would always do. And so the question is obviously, you know, is there always such a feature map for a symmetric function? Let me give you an example of where this fails. So let's take a function k of x and x prime, which is 1 if x minus x prime is less equal than 1 and 0 else. And I'm going to pick three points on a line. Let's say 0, 1, and 2. And I want to look at their kernel matrix. So their kernel matrix, so this is basically the matrix of all k of xi and xj's, is 1 here. I mean, this is not a kernel, so. Well, between 0 and 1, it's also 1. And here it's 0. Here we have all 1s. We have another 0. We have 1 and 1. So if you take this matrix and put it into Octave and type in eig, you will see that one of the eigenvalues is negative. Okay. So how did we get there from this, right? This looks a little bit confusing. We're going to typically call this kernel matrix capital K. So let's say I have some vector V, which is written as sum over alpha i phi of xi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the length of this vector. Actually, I'm going to compute the length of this vector squared. Well, that is nothing else than v dot v. OK? Which, by plugging in those terms, is going to be nothing else than the inner product between sum over i alpha i phi of xi. And I'm just going to use a sum over all the j's, because otherwise I have to re-index sum over the j's alpha j phi of xj. Okay. So now since this is a bilinear form, I can pull these terms out and I get sum over i and j alpha i alpha j in a product between phi of xi and phi of xj. Right? Now comes the kernel trick. <laughs> 
this is nothing else than k of xi xj. which I'm going to define as kij. So now I can write this as alpha transposed k alpha. So now, what happens if k has a negative eigenvalue? OK. Oh, the train comes, yes. But, OK. What happens? I kind of didn't hear. Somebody made a suggestion, right? I think the railway really doesn't like kernels. OK, fine. Still, what happens? OK, they might get more. But OK, so what happens here is if I have a negative eigenvalue, well, after all, you know, so this is a symmetric matrix. So we have, you know, we get this k times v, well, let's call it k times beta equals lambda times beta. And if this thing here is less than 0, we would get that if I set alpha equals beta, I would get that no, the length of v squared is lambda, which is less than 0. And that must never, ever happen. Right? So basically, I would get negative lengths. So who of you has done physics? OK. Do you remember a case where you had negative lengths? Exactly. So special relativity, you had exactly the case that you had this cone of reachability. And if the lengths were negative, it mean, meant you couldn't reach it or you could reach it depending on how you define things. But basically, this is probably the only real case where people care very much about those negative eigenvalues in a big way. For kernels, you absolutely want to avoid them. So what this means is to show that something is not a kernel, it's sufficient to take you know, some random data, compute the kernel matrix, and if one of the eigenvalues is negative, you're done for. So fun story on the side. A um, colleague of mine, very good researcher, very strong with theory and so on, he told me about some new thing, a kernel that he thought he'd come up with. And I looked at it and thought, that's not a kernel. And he told me, yeah, he has the proof almost complete. And I still didn't buy it. And so um, I spent about maybe 10 minutes writing a small MATLAB script to generate kernel matrices. And very quickly, it generated kernel matrices with negative eigenvalues. And I saved the guy a lot of time. By the way, the same thing happened to me too in a related case where my proof wasn't going through and somebody else gave me an algebraic counterexample. So quite often, if you can't prove that something is a kernel, chances are it isn't. And I would very much suggest that you go and spend a little bit of time first actually numerically checking whether the condition always holds. The fact that the condition always holds numerically doesn't mean strictly that it is a kernel. It just means that it's a kernel on the data at which you've looked at it. This is a necessary condition, not a sufficient one. OK. So uh, we have another five minutes left. Now let me show you the math that goes with it. So this is one of those really big theorems that you know, will apply to over and over. And when you hear it, it sounds intimidating, but it actually isn't. It's basically just this alpha transpose k alpha now written out with matrices, so with, with operators and functions. So if you've never done function analysis, think linear algebra with infinite dimensional vectors and the usual you know, caveats to make sure that the sums all still converge. So basically, it's infinite dimensional linear algebra where the mathemat mathematicians made sure that it's safe. By the way, this is pretty much how it developed, because the physicists actually developed a lot of the machinery. And then it took about 10, 20 years later 
until mathematicians made it actually mathematically safe to use. Okay. Uh, now, the Mercer theorem says for any function k that's symmetric and that's square integrable, in other words, the integral over, you know, this actually exists, the integral k of x and x prime, f of x, f of x prime, dx dx prime, if this is greater or equal than zero for all such functions, then there exists an eigenvector eigenvalue like decomposition. So these are called eigenfunctions and they are still called eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues, where these guys here are greater or equal than zero for all i. As a matter of fact, I mean, you can say greater than zero because if there's zero, well, you can as well omit this from the sum, right? So what it means is basically this is like the infinite dimensional version of this sum here. And so obviously if I have this, then, well, this is a special case of the above condition. I can just put delta distributions at those points, right? So that's what the theorem says. Now that doesn't really help you very much yet because proving it directly this way is sometimes very hard. And so what people have done is <clears throat> they've used all sorts of nice <clears throat> functional analytic tools to turn this Mercer theorem into a condition that's much easier to check. And when we'll do kernels, we'll, for instance, get to tools like, well, do a Fourier transform of the kernel. If it's greater or equal than zero, we know it's fine. And that's much easier to do. So <clears throat> let's look at a few properties. And these are actually very, very basic things. So the distance between two points, right? That's just, you know, the norm of phi of x minus phi of x prime squared. That's the distance in this feature space. Now, since it's that term squared, I can write it as an inner product. So we get the second line. Um, yeah, OK. I guess you can see what I mean. And that's basically just, you know, phi of x dot phi of x, phi of x dot prime dot phi of x prime, minus twice that inner product. It's just second binomial formula. There's nothing special in it. And now I just do query replace of all the phi's into kernel functions. And you're done. So overall, if you want to kernelize an algorithm, if you have some, some linear, linear expression, you want to make sure that in the end all your phi's disappear. If you have any phi's left, you, can, you are not done yet kernelizing the algorithm. And it sounds very crude, but this is a very, very efficient tool to kernelize an algorithm. Okay. Fun? Couldn't that be minus two k x x prime? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Forgot that. Yes. Thanks. Uh, kernel matrix, we already defined this. And so these entries really tell us, you know, how similar two observations are. So this thing we already proved, right? This is what we did before over here. Right. And then the kernel expansion, we also already had that, right? So this is really important. And there will be, the, you can actually then prove that in some cases, even though these phi of x's might be in an, in an infinite dimensional space, these expansions will always be finite dimensional. So that just comes from the same source as when we ran the perceptron algorithm. Remember, the dimensionality in which this data was lying in didn't really matter for any of the guarantees that we gave. We just cared about how hard the problem is geometrically. There was nowhere any dimension dependence explicitly. And the same thing happens here. For a lot of algorithms, you only care about you know, the space that's really spanned by the data and nothing beyond that. Okay? And so all you do is you just really plug in the definition for W, that's sum over alpha i phi of x i. And so then we have this kernel expansion. So this is an important equation that you'll need over and over and over. So 
Here's the counterexample. So that's exactly the one that we looked at before. And so you can actually see that one of the eigenvalues is 1 minus square root 2. And that's obviously not very effective. Okay. Now let's look at, look at the examples, and then we're done. So we'll pick up on, on that tomorrow again, uh, on Monday again. Uh, so things like Gaussians, Laplacians, polynomial functions, B splines, and so on. And we'll get to all of them. So things like this. They're all kernels. So what I hope that I got you a little bit more familiar with today is what kernels do. I know this is probably one of the harder lectures because it's conceptually probably quite different from what you're used to. We'll pick it up again on Monday. And if you want to have chocolates on Monday, get on the leaderboard top five. So more chocolates on Monday. <laughs>